Good afternoon, everybody. So I'm Dr. Sherman. I'm the medical, the medical director here at Medical Optometry America's third location in Horsham. Um, today, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about dry eye disease. It's, uh, it sounds a little innocuous, but it can be a miserable experience for patients who are really suffering, and uh, it can be really very complex to treat. Um, the most up-to-date definition we have of what dry eye is, is it's a multifactorial disease of the ocular surface characterized by a loss of homeostasis, the ability to regulate itself in the tear film, accompanied by ocular symptoms, so the things that you guys feel, the dryness, greediness, burning, um, in which the tear film instability and hyperosmolarity, ocular surface inflammation and damage, and neurosensory abnormalities play etiological roles. Which means it's very complicated. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> So much, right? Um, but globally, um, depending on the studies that you read, uh, the prevalence of dry eye across the globe is somewhere between five and fifty percent. Um, I personally think it's probably over fifty percent, just with uh, our the way our environments are maintained and the habits and the work environments we all live in now they are all conducive to the development of dry eye disease. You know, contact lens wear makes you more likely to be a dry eye disease sufferer. Digital device use and dry, uh, dry environments. Across uh, most of the modern literature, the median prevalence is about 15%, but again, I think that number is incredibly low. I think in reality, it's quite a bit higher than that. Um, domestically, 15%, again, after age 50 or dry eye patients, 20% after 75, and 23% of postmenopausal women have dry eye disease. Well, what's interesting is if you survey, if you take uh, surveys that would indicate that somebody is a dry eye patient, depending again on the study rate, 40 to 70% of patients who are very symptomatic have never been dry, diagnosed with dry eye. You know, they walk into the office and they say, you know, I've got dryness and grittiness and burning and my vision fluctuates and nobody's ever, they are completely unaware that the problem is that they have dry eye. So these numbers are potentially off by a factor of two or three, you know, this, this should be quite a bit higher. Um, so classically, dry eye is sort of thought of as, uh, you know, we triage our patients, we assess their risk factors, we use our diagnostic tests, and then we classify you as sort of an evaporative patient or an aqueous deficient patient. A patient who has a problem producing and metabolizing uh, oils in their tear film, or a patient who has an issue producing and metabolizing the watery components of the tear film. The way I think about it is that dry eye is really a secondary collection of signs and symptoms that are caused by different forms of ocular surface disease. Um, dry eye, virtually nobody has primary dry eye. Dry eye is secondary to something else. And the key to managing an individual's dry eye comes in the management of whatever their causing pathology is. So it's much more complicated than this aqueous versus evaporative kind of paradigm that we have. So certainly, you can have dry eye from compromised tear film metabolism. You can have some problem producing and metabolizing uh, mucin or mucus. The white part of the eye produces uh, mucus that lines the surface. It makes the sur surface of the eye wettable so that the aqueous portion, the wet portion produced by your lacrimal gland, can stick to the surface. And then the myelin, the oily portion produced by the gl uh, glands in the eyelid, can lay on top and keep that watery portion from evaporating. You can have problems producing and metabolizing any of these, and you, that can give you dry eye. But what's, why do you have problems producing and metabolizing those tear film components? What's the issue? For a lot of patients, it's systemic inflammatory disease. You know, these patients aren't, maybe not told that they have dry eye, but if you have Sjogren's or rheumatoid arthritis, di diabetes, rosacea, or lupus, and sarcoidosis, all of these patients, the vast majority of them, will come in with dry eye complaints. Everybody that comes into our office gets a dry eye survey, and over half of the patients have a significant score, and we have to talk about the quality of their vision and how their eyes feel, 
and other systemic comorbidities they may have that are actually causing the problems with their eyes. And then you can have a compromised or damaged anatomy. So this is the example I have here is uh, somebody with a Bell's palsy. So somebody who has a Bell's palsy that doesn't recover completely um, will have an eyelid that has subnormal tension to it. And that will make the eyelid incapable of properly dispersing the components of the tear foam. So maybe their physiology is perfectly normal in terms of the production of the tear foam components, um, but their anatomy makes it so that they can't use those components properly. This is, you know, this is, and these patients are very difficult to handle. Um, but it's not a, this isn't a simple, you know, use more teardrops. Like this patient has a problem and addressing it is going to be complicated. They may need uh, a very unconventional therapy or even a surgery to correct problems related to anatomy. And sometimes patients can have uh, neuropathic issues, almost like a, a patient who's had a, uh, a, a shingles rash can be in chronic pain for many months or even years after the rash resolves completely, patients can have infections and injuries that leave them with chronic discomfort that's interpreted as dry eye. Um, and the last one is infestations. So a very uh, normal little bug that uh, lives in our pores and our skin is called Demodex. And almost everybody has a low amount of Demodex in their follicles and in their pores, that's considered normal. But if you have various skin conditions, it can create an environment where the Demodex can rapidly reproduce and leave you with things like really bad blepharitis or rosacea. And there are a lot of ways, we have a lot of tools to evaluate your dry eye and determine what the actual cause is. So we have vital dyes. Some of these dyes, this is my personal favorite, this is lysamine green is what it's called. Um, the vast majority of the time, what you is going to pick up dye with lysamine green is dead or devitalized surface tissue cells. You typically cannot see this at all without lysamine, um, which is why I love lysamine, because it lets me see things that I can't see otherwise. Um, we can measure your tear production. This is kind of an older test that not a lot of people like, but I like it quite a bit. Almost all my dry patients are gonna have a Shermer uh, before and after initiating whatever our therapy is gonna be. We can use uh, point of care diagnostics to actually measure attributes about your tear film chemistry and determine if there's a you know, biochemical issue that maybe we can modulate to relieve your symptoms. And we can actually image the structure of those oil glands. These are pretty good with the exception of one gland here that's had it's short and it's almost completely atrophied. And we'll talk about this a little bit more. But the point is, if you are a dry eye patient, if you're something who's very symptomatic and you haven't had a thorough evaluation of your ocular surface and your ocular health, there's a very real chance that your doctor may not be getting to the root of your problem. So there are a lot of dry eye treatments. There are so many different causes for dry eye. We have just as many treatments for dry eye. Mm -hmm. The first thing that I talk to everybody about is nutraceuticals and foundational therapy. The number one thing that you can do at home for the most common type of dry eye is start taking a good omega-3 vitamin. Specifically, you want one that has re-esterified EPA and DHA. A lot of the uh, omega-3s and the fish oils that you get in the supermarket, um, they are not re-esterified. So their bioavailability is very low. They have very high levels of alcohol. Alcohol makes you burp. So if you are taking these fish oils and you're getting fishy burps after, that is your body telling you that the fish oil you're taking is a very low quality product. If it has been re-esterified, it has virtually no alcohol in it, and the bioavailability is very high. So you want to make sure all of these supplements are not created equal. You want to make sure you have a good one. Um, the next thing is pharmaceuticals. So many patients are told over and over again, um, you know, <coughs> use tears, or use more tears, or use different tears. Um, but that is only the smallest piece of the puzzle and for a lot of patients, you put a teardrop in, you blink, and most of it runs down your cheek, 
and you feel better for maybe a couple minutes and then you go right back to feeling the way that you were. So we can modulate your tear film chemistry and the inflammation on the ocular surface through different medications. There's three different medications in, or three different active ingredients, I should say, in four formulations here. Um, but up until 10-ish years ago, we didn't have any pharmaceuticals that we could treat patients dry with. We have them now. And if you're somebody who's dumping tears into your eyes and your doctor hasn't talked to you about this, hmm, that might be a good time to ask them about it. And then there's punctual occlusion. Some patients, uh, like I said, need to put so many tears in. Maybe if we do a Schirmer test and we measure their tear film production, it's really low. And they say, you know, when I put a drop in, I feel great. Um, but I have, to, I have to like drink these drops. <laughs> I, you know, I've got to put a drop in every hour or two. We can use a dissolvable collagen plug or a non-dissolvable silicone plug in your tear duct where your tears drain normally to keep your own tears on your eye longer. So you're not dumping as many tears in your eye. Keep, and this keep, you know, you're lubricating your eye with the best tears, your own. One of the, the latest and greatest treatments, and we have it here in this office, is intense pulse light. Intense pulse light is light of a very specific wavelength, depending on the condition that we're trying to treat, that is used to cauterize uh, weak pro-inflammatory vasculature. We can use it around the eyelids to weaken the body's supply of inflammatory mediators to the ocular tissues. One of the nice side effects is it gives you a lighter, tighter, and brighter skin, is what I tell everybody. This was a rosacea patient who had a, a single course of IPL done, and we treat usually from right in front of the ear, the tragus, across your cheeks and your nose to the other tragus. And you can see with one treatment, their uh, fragile and pro-inflammatory vasculature has regressed significantly. Yeah. It's incredible. So not only does it help you with your dry eye, it takes all of this redness and you know, dramatically reduces the irritation and inflammation you have, but it's good for your skin too. <laughs> Bonus. <Yeah>. <laughs> and then there's mybography. So one of the other great treatments, this is probably the gold standard treatment for meibomian gland disease, uh, is lipoflow. So when a patient has meibomian gland dysfunction, all of these beautiful glands that run through the upper and lower eyelid, they look like uh, piano keys or little fingers, they begin to shorten and then atrophy completely. We can see a decrease in the quality and the quantity of your myelin production in the microscope when we do our exam before we ever get to this this position, where we want to identify dry patients with, that primarily are caused by lid disease like this, we want to find the symptomatic patient when they're still here. Because then we can treat, we can unobstruct all of their glands, and they get to keep them and they feel better. Once a patient has gotten here, it's too late. Opening the glands isn't going to help anymore because all of these glands have atrophied, they've all died. Um, these patients are extremely difficult to manage because they really have what I think should be considered an organ tissue that has necrosed. It's, it's not coming back, it's dead. So we need to find the patients here and here so that we can treat them and keep them from ever getting to this level of disease. And lipoflow does that. It's this really cool eyelid, they call them activators. I don't know why they call them activators. They look like little funny heater sandwiches, but that's, it is something that uh, surrounds the top and bottom eyelid and it heats them up and gently applies a series of pressure pulses and gets all of your abnormal gland contents evacuated so that they can return to normal function. And there's amniotic memory. This is one of the most incredible things. Um, I imagine the inventor of this technology is going to win a Nobel at some point. He hasn't yet, but I'm pretty sure it's coming. Um, we can take the amnion, the innermost lining of the placenta, and we can prepare it in such a way that we can apply it to the eye. It promotes healing, reduces inflammation, and is incredibly regenerative. Most of the, or I should say all the healing that occurs uh, in utero 
is all regenerative healing. There's no scar formation. It's pretty incredible. It's occasionally a fetus will have a surgery in utero, and when the child is born, the child has no surgical scars, and that is because healing in utero is based on uh, getting the correct structure down. Whereas once you've been born, healing is about survival. We want to stop bleeding. We want to stop infection, and scar formation is really good at doing that. But we can fool the eye into thinking it's back in your utero and heal properly without excessive inflammation, without scarring, and by truly regenerating tissues and nerves. Another great therapy is recombinant neurotrophic growth factor. So this is useful specifically for patients who have what's called neurotrophic keratitis, a patient that's had some damage to the nerves that control the way the eye maintains its health. Um, we have been able to grow bacteria that produce human neurotrophic growth factor and we can bottle it, apply it to the eye, and we can have patients with these non-healing wounds, um, relatively common. It's, it's, it's very similar to like a diabetic, a non-healing ulcer on the foot of a diabetic. Um, it's not that their body is incapable of healing, but they have accumulated so much nerve damage, the body cannot recognize that it's injured. You can get similar types of injuries to the eye, and it's miraculous. You can treat a patient for four weeks with this, and the wound will close. It's incredible. And then there's autologous serum. So you can have uh, your blood drawn and centrifuge and se separated into serum, plasma, and everything else. And you can actually have the serum and all of its wonderful uh, growth factors prepared uh, for use in the eye. And this is wonderful for patients who are in pain. Patients uh, who are you know, they don't have a lot of ocular surface findings. Maybe they don't look terrible, but every time I have a patient who's in terrible pain and we start them on autologous, autologous serum, they almost always improve dramatically. And this is something I'm very interested in, but it's not available, it's still experimental. Um, but we think that the platelet-rich plasma, once your blood's been, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, platelet-rich plasma, once your blood's been centrifuged, you have your serum, your plasma and everything else down here, we think your platelet-rich plasma may even be more effective than your serum. Um, I haven't been able to find anybody locally that will prepare a platelet-rich plasma for me yet, but I'm sure it's coming. And then the last thing we have is scleral lenses. This is particularly wonderful for patients who have had anatomy that's been destroyed by trauma or surgery. My favorite example is um, I had a patient who had a melanoma uh, just outside of his eye. He got radiation for it. Um, he wore a corneal shield during the procedure. It destroyed the melanoma, but he looks like a burn victim now. He can't close his eye. When I met him, his eye had been sewn shut twice. And he was told that if, they didn't find, if he didn't find another solution, he was gonna lose his eye. Well, this gentleman now, he wears a scleral lens that is filled with uh, preservative-free saline around the clock, and that same, that, so his eye, when the lens is in, lives in this restorative, ultra-hydrating environment. So, you know, he went from telling patients, somebody telling him, you're gonna lose your eye, to seeing comfort, he has almost 20-20 vision in that eye now. I mean, he's, he's doing very, very well. Um, but, what I'm trying to get at is the dry eye is complicated. And it's not simply a matter of more tears or different tears. The patients are incredibly unique, and your therapy should be just as unique as the patient. Questions? Well, I have severe dry eye. Yes. And I think, um, I think when my I went straight into menopause due to um, medication, yeah. side effect, and I went like. I mean, I had a slight dry eye, but then it became like so bad that severe. Yeah, it's, it's really really yeah. bad, and I have to put the restatius I use. Um, yeah, restatius is a yeah, good one. Yeah, I use that, um, but that doesn't <laughs> then yeah. then I have to put the gel thing in. Like, Some gel, uh, sure. Spongy thing in, and I have to sleep with it, and then that 
Yeah, your moisture goggles to wear your night. Some days, mine's okay, but some days, like, it's, even now, like, I can see, like, the neighbors, you know? Yeah. It's all of the... It's... Oh, yeah. Yeah, postmenopausal dry eye is uh, particularly challenging um, because it doesn't... My experience has been that it doesn't respond well to pharmacologics. So, like, your dry eye, your restasis type medications. Um, typically, you guys end up needing a lot of supportive lubrication. Pumpsal plugs typically work very well. Um, because, again, my experience has been that your tear film production um, becomes very, very low after menopause. Um, so having the temporary or semi-permanent plugs put in, so you don't need to use drops all the time, like, works wonderfully. I don't know if that's something you've ever done I, before. I use morning and night um, spacious, um, but I know that, I think because of the other main Taking also, yeah. Other medications have side effects. Oh, absolutely! So many, really, so many medications give you dry eye. It's dries everything out, yeah. your mouth, your eyes. I mean, yeah. it's just so bad. So I think because I'm also taking another medication for like my headache now, um, it's kind of getting worse. So I'm like, you know, I mean, this is the first time I actually saw something like this. I've been to many different doctors, yeah. and they say you have dry eyes, you know. Well, I know, you know, I know. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you can tell me your eyes are dry. <laughs> but, you know, so they say, well, we're safe, just give it. I'm like, yeah. well, is that the only thing that I can do? So oh, you can put that, you know, eye to hot It doesn't really work. Nothing works, nothing. Yeah. You know, and I feel like, you know, kind of very frustrated because. Yeah, it's know. easy. I, I end up being a lot of patients, you know, sixth dry eye doctor <laughs> because they go from person to person and trying to find somebody who will help them, and they will all do that. You know, they, they, they have. They're kind of one trick ponies, you know, they, say they have one medication they like to prescribe or one thing they recommend and if it doesn't, if it doesn't work, they just kind of wash their hands and they say, I don't, I don't know what to do for you. Yeah, that's, that's um, what I'm facing. So I feel like, you know, I'm, I don't know, I feel like at my age, it's not going to get better. It's only going to get worse. And if I don't treat it now, it, I don't know if I you're, even... You're, you're you know. exactly right. Dry, dry eye is, a, is chronic mm -hmm. and progressive. Very rarely, there is, there is some insult that compromises your ocular surface health. And if it would recover, well then maybe you could take some teardrops for a week or two and eventually you go back to normal. Mm -hmm. But when you have something like Menopause, you know, is a great example that changes you on a biochemical level. You're not gonna, you're not gonna get better. What we need to do is get you comfortable and keep you from getting worse. No, yeah. that's what that's what I, that's what I feel like. Yeah. I feel like uh, down the road, um, I you know I used to wear contact. I can't wear contact on, and it's yeah. like immediately. I mean, I can't put anything in my eye, yeah. so I have to wear glasses, and it's not the most comfortable thing, but you know, I have to live with it, and yeah. I'm like, well, you know what, if I lose a sight of my eye, then that's a big problem, so, uh, you know, I thought I really need to come in, you know. Yeah, so absolutely, there are, there, are, there are so many options, and if there are things you haven't tried before, yeah, come on in, we'll try it. Yes. I have a question, I've been taking this basis for two years, and it really isn't working in my Doctor suggests impossible pumpful plugs. Are there any side effects? Is it like a foreign plus? And I'm allergic to everything. I'm very yeah, um, I'm, I'm allergic to so, stitches. And yeah, stuff. yeah. The, the big thing about so there's two types of pumpful plugs. There are uh, dissolvable plugs that are you know they're similar to a collagen plug, um, and there are semi-permanent uh, silicone pumpful plugs. So if, you have, if you have a silicone allergy, do not have a silicone pumpful plug put in. <laughs> you will have a terrible reaction. Um, I've never seen anybody have a bad, uh, have an immunologic response, like an allergic response mm -hmm. to a dissolvable collagen plug, but I'll be the first to tell you, anything's possible. I probably be the first one um, to tell yeah. <laughs> There are, um, but I mean, I, I, I use a lot of plugs, and I mean, plugs are great for the, for the right people. Um, they're, the, when you use a dissolvable plug, it sits in the cannulas, sort of in the drain, rather than your silicone plug that sits on the drain. I prefer not to use silicone plugs because they are much more likely to cause uh, irritation, inflammation, or infection. Um, dissolvable plugs, they're kind of a pain for patients because uh, I like six month plugs, it means you have to see me twice a year to get them replaced. But if you're one of my really bad dry eye patients, I'm probably seeing you at least twice a year anyway, so it's not that big a deal. Um, but they're very safe. 
And I have, I've put in hundreds, maybe thousands of punctal plugs, and I've had one patient uh, have a, uh, a mild canaliculitis, a, mi a mild infection they got after the plug was put in. Uh, you know, one in, I don't know, thousands. So that's, they're, they're very safe. Yeah, yeah that's, that's my, my experience has been they're very, very safe. And all the FDA research that got them approved shows the same. I mean, it's again. You don't want. You definitely don't want to use a silicone plug in somebody who has a silicone allergy. Um, but the dissolvable plugs are safer than the silicone plugs, and they're just incredibly well tolerated. And again, the the most important thing is that is understanding that no one of these is for everybody. Some some person might need one. Some person might need the other. Some person might need B, C, and F. Some person might need A and D. Uh, it is if it was if it was as easy as you know take some tears, there wouldn't be a you know billion dollar dry eye industry and you know people like me when we have to go to school learn how to treat people's dry eye, it would it would be easy. But it's not easy. It's complicated. Um, but plugs plugs are safe and for the right person again they're wonderfully effective. Yeah. Thank you. Um, why would you have dry eye on one eye and not the other? So that is almost always uh, an environmental or anatomical problem. Um, so a lot of my patients who have what I call floppy eyelid syndrome, um, they have very lax collagen in the eyes. Um, if they are, if they have worse dry eye, they may be a side sleeper, and it may be the way. Oh, I definitely have side. Yeah. So it may be, it may it may be the way that uh, your pillow is interacting with your eyelid um, at night. It may be that you're a side sleeper and you sleep with a fan on and your exposed eye is maybe the one that's drying out at night. Um, it is almost always, when if somebody is unilateral, there's almost always a difference in the anatomy. Maybe they've had like a, an eyelid laceration, so they have an injury to one eye mm -hmm. uh, and maybe not the other and the eye that had the injury will be drier. Um, or some combination of things about their anatomy and their environment makes it so that one of their eyes is just much more prone to dryness. Can it just be random though? Because with allergies, I notice that like one eye is always itchier than the other. Right. <laughs> so like, usually, why, so, why is that? So <laughs> dryness is really interesting because people are handed. So what happens with dryness is you rub your eyes with your dominant hand. And the vast majority of time, the itchier eye is the one that the patient is rubbing with their dominant that's no, it's been, always the other eye. Are you sure? <laughs> I'm pretty sure. I was going to say, it's, right you, hand and it's my you, left eye is itchier. You, you, would, you would be the exception. Um, <laughs> now that being said, if it's an allergy um, and it's left-sided, I don't know how much driving you do with your car window down, but uh, it could be something as simple as that. Uh, You're having more allergens exposed to your left side. Yeah, um, interesting. Yeah. And it can be... It can be something, you know, just that simple. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm somebody... I, I have pretty dry eyes. Um, I can't drive my car with my air condition pointed at me or mm -hmm. up. It makes my eyes so incredibly dry. I have to point my air conditioning at the floor. Yeah. Um, but there are little things like that. You know, if you have dry eye, um, you know, roll your window up and point your AC at the floor, and you might be surprised how easily something like that uh, improves you know, the quality, the quality and stability of your vision and your comfort. For anybody who is interested, I had the picture of 